My guests today on In the Credits are Bob Clark and Peter Billingsley, the director and star of the classic Christmas Story. Welcome, Bob and Peter. Thank Glad you. Glad to have you with us. Christmas Story obviously has taken on a life of its own over the last 20 years. This is the 20th anniversary. You first heard Gene Shepard, the author of many of the stories which were used in the Christmas Story, on the radio, and that's what inspired you to uh, approach Gene about doing something like this. Tell us a little bit about that. I was in Coral Gables, Florida. I was in the late 60s. I was just out of college. I was working in the Miami film industry. Quite a story itself. Um, and uh, I was driving to a date in Coral Gables um, and I turned on the radio and I heard this man telling this very strange story about Indiana and something about the uh, a light pole and all that, and I got quite fascinated. And I said, "I got to hear the end of the story. I'll just drive around the block, and you know, so I can hear the end." Well, 45 minutes later, because Gene takes 45 minutes just to tell the tongue sticking, freezing to the light pole story, I stopped and uh, picked up my very irate date, or maybe she wasn't even there. I don't remember. But I determined at that time I've got to know more. Who is this guy? And I started looking into Shepard. I got his book, and then I determined um, I had to uh, do this as a movie. And I sought him out, and um, he pushed me away the first few times. I was this young unknown, but finally he agreed to meet with me, and we struck it off. And he liked what I had to say about organizing a gene used to tour Princeton, McCarter, the all the university. Uh, circuit and a great many of the stories in Christmas Story are taken from his storytelling, not from In God We Trust, the mm -hmm. book of short stories. So that's how it all began and that was a beginning of a 12-year sojourn, what am I talking about, closer to 15 years to get the movie made eventually in 1983. You kept getting resistance from the studios who didn't see what you saw in no. the stories. Well, first I got resistance because I was a young filmmaker with no real films, a couple of very sleazy, low-budget films. But once I began to make some impact and even had done then Black Christmas and Tribute, which Jack Lemmon got an Academy Award nomination for in a movie called Murder by Decree, which had all the great British actors. Brilliant Sherlock Holmes film. Right, but Just even that. then, I was not able to get the studios to do this little-budget movie that I kept telling them was going to be something special. Mm -hmm. They resisted, narration was dead. They said movies were not movie, not talking, they were movies, movie images. Mm -hmm. And there hadn't been any successful narration movies in quite a few years. Um, Probably since To Kill a Mockingbird. To kill, that was about the last one, and at that time it was considered dead. Those were the various reasons. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't commercial, it was sweet. But until I did Porky's, and Porky's was a huge success, and then I had sort of control and power. They finally let me do Christmas Story, just really let the jerk do it so he can go on and do some movies. And luckily, like they left you alone. Yes. Nobody I, interfered. You were able to shoot when you wanted, where you wanted, with the cast you wanted. That's correct. Which is a blessing. Well, yeah. basically, I grew up as, as an independent filmmaker. All my early films, none were done by studios, so I had produced and done exactly. It wasn't until I made a huge amount of money and had big grossing films, the studios started trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> no, that's not fair. They never did. I had pretty good freedom most of my career. But Christmas Story, they merely gave me the money. Part of it, uh, I think I told the story before, they first, we were going to start shooting the 1st of January and MGM was short of money. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, you're going to have to wait a few months. And I said, I can't. It's Christmas. And I'm like, I put my own money. I put $250,000 of my own money in to start the movie. They paid me back. But those are the days in 83, those, those things, well, I don't think that would happen today, but that's the long-winded version. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's doubtful that the film would have turned out as well under today's circumstances. Could with, be. It was control. You would have been told to change the scene and <laughs> why is this so funny to you and so on and so forth. Right. Now, the script is essentially a, a compilation of uh, both short stories and Gene's tours. Right. There is no book, even though there are references to it. There is really no one book which was the source. But when you were first, when you had the script written, you and Gene, and who else contributed to the script? Uh, his wife, uh, Lee. Gene did 
a lot of the, the script himself, and then you consulted with him on s certain scenes and added things. Right? Uh, basically, to be real honest, it's, it's all based on Gene's work. There are no characters that aren't part of his work. Mm -hmm. There's really no situations, a few little ones. But I was the screenplay writer, and Gene and Lee, I, I constructed the script yeah. and that part of it, but I constructed it from Gene's from the material. What screenplay format? Yeah, for it. right, so to it put it into the form of a screenplay, yeah. but uh, it was all, you know, 90 percent of it is already exists in Shepard's work. We may right. have added 10 or 15 percent in the creative process. When you were so. thinking of Ralphie, did you have Peter in mind initially, or did this come after... Uh, some time. Never heard of the low booger. Never I heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't hear anything back when I went in. I had gone in and I auditioned, was, had been working since about two and a half, and I think I was 12. Mm -hmm. and you go on these auditions as mm -hmm. a kid and you get dragged around, you know, and you go four appointments a day. And I went in for this movie and I don't even think I read the script and kind of liked it and then didn't hear anything for months. So you figure, all right, I guess I didn't get that one. Then you're on to something else. Was that when you were still on NBC with real people or was this around mm -hmm. that time? Pretty, was good, about the... pretty good reference, yeah. yeah. Um, Probably so. Right. I was. Um, I think it just maybe done one season or something like that. Mm -hmm. and was in the middle of doing that. Um, and you're trying to get other parts. You're trying to go sure. into movies on the hiatus. Yeah. Didn't hear anything. Then about a month later, got a call that said they want you to go to Canada and take a screen test. And the way it's often done with sort of multicast films is you put you want to find the real chemistry between people. So they bring up a bunch of and you read each other's roles. Mm -hmm. And then you know you'll be Ralphie with three other. Randy's right. and Flicks and Schwartz, and then you'll be Flick, and then they'll be Randy, and you kind of mix around. And the goal is to not get dismissed early, <laughs> sort of, because you know it. <laughs> you know, they always try to make you feel good about it. So when you leave, you know it's pretty much over. Then, you know, eventually it gets whittled down to the end. Basically, uh, Peter really was just about the first person I saw. He was already a bit of a star from the TV show. And being the first, uh, naturally he couldn't be it, and we went on to another eight or 10,000. Really? <laughs> Children that we saw for that role, and <laughs> finally amazing. one day I said to myself, what am I doing here? And I went back and uh, looked at the first bit of uh, rough footage. I said, am, am I out of my mind? This is the kid. I, he's not uh, a Hollywood kid. He's on this TV show, but uh, I must be nuts. Let's get him up here. And uh, he was destined to be it from the first, but he was literally the first child that the I saw. The first single that you saw? Really? You were the first, because he was the most famous Sort of. There were other child. I don't remember any other child star I even considered at the time. I don't even remember any child stars. But uh, after eight thousand, I this came back amazing. to the original yeah, the one. Or, yeah. Was, we was just Gene, well, it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah, it had to be. It, it was just uh, perfect for you. Not to have cast him would have been. In fact, tragic. everybody in their film. This is one of those rare instances, I think, where literally everybody in the movie inhabits the role as if it was designed for them. I, There's I, no better father true. than Darren McGavin. That's for sure. Or mother than Melinda, or the boys, and little Randy, Ian. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible, and Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, how many times does that happen? Usually you'll find mm -hmm. a film that has half a dozen performers that seem to fit, and there's always an odd man or an odd woman who doesn't quite work. Right. You say, well, except for that. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you watch the film, you say, that every role looks as if it was written specifically for them. Well, I'm yeah. extremely meticulous in my casting, but yet I know when I see them. Mm -hmm. and it's never any, sometimes it's the first day of casting. There are any doubt. I'll see a few more people. Yeah, but, just uh, instinct. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Here, it, 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 I had to dredge it out. It took time. Um, Ian, we found, the, I was at home in Massachusetts, Two days before we to go were to begin shooting, we did not have a Randy yet, if you remember. Oh, that's right, yeah. And I brought really? Ian up uh -huh. to my house. From and he was in wherever. Massachusetts? No, we flew him from wherever they lived, uh, I can't remember, to my house and really? tested him there. And I said, oh, I, am I deluding myself because I'm desperate, i got to start shooting? And I said, no, I'm not. This is the boy. And God knows he was, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. There were some concerns about that because it was the whole chemistry thing where you want to spend time at least a little bit with the people and that you're going to be working with, particularly when you're going to be playing brothers. Right. That's right. right. So we and you had it, to work together because it had to look like a family. Right. But they That's, didn't get to they it. Didn't they get a chance you to. met him virtually. Is that right? I think you got a day's work or so. Yeah. But that was about it. That's remarkable. Yeah. I had not found him, and I knew I hadn't found him, and here he was. It was like was Gene in on any of the auditions? Did he have to approve anything? He, he no. wouldn't have approval, but did he sit in? He didn't. No. No, you wouldn't let him. <laughs> no. I wouldn't Very strong personality. I love Gene, yeah, but he was... Uh, 
compulsive and Gene was impulsive. pretty passionate. He'd be on the set sometimes. And oh yeah, no, he was it there. Wasn't uh, wasn't shy about speaking up. Yeah. He had his own you know, party. about things. But from my point, of, there'd be a time that maybe he would go to the bathroom or something, and then Gene would be around. <laughs> he'd run up to me and say, "Now you got to say it like this." That's and great. Come back and say, but the the sense that I got was that here were two guys that were just so passionate about the film they were making. It had been really a long journey. It was, you know, really Gene's words. It was so much of your vision, and it was such a different experience for me. I had been involved in two much bigger budgeted pictures, Paternity with Burt Reynolds, oh, yes. which really did not do well. Right. Um, and then a movie called Hockey Tonk Freeway, directed by John Schlesinger, that in 79 was $26 million. Mm. And they painted a town in Florida pink. I mean, it was a crazy I movie. Remember it. And um, they bombed. But yeah. you got the sense on those that the expectations were so high, and mm -hmm. everyone was saying, oh, we're going to have a hit. And there was sort of an assumption that this would translate. And the difference on Christmas Story was you guys were so pr so prepared. I never met a filmmaker more prepared than Bob. He had his note cards. I mean, he'd been thinking about this, obviously, for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And so there was, it was such a different energy. It was so nice to just be focused on the process and not really on the results, and just knowing that if you made a good movie, good things would come from it. And it's it was a real lesson for me, even at a young age, it was a completely, completely different experience. Well, it's remarkable that the film has so many scenes that are memorable. Howard Hawks, in an interview one time years ago, said, if you have five good scenes in a movie, it'll be okay. Mm. And then the rest of the scenes will be held together by those five good scenes. But in mm -hmm. Christmas Story, virtually every scene is memorable. And that's... Yeah. That is quite unusual, where you have mm -hmm. every scene. People can, you've had people come up to you and say, I love the leg mm -hmm. lamp. I love the kid getting his tongue stuck. I love the bunny costume. Each like, person seems to have a Every person has favorite. a different yeah. thing yeah. to hang on to, and, and that's so unusual. That they can relate to. It is, yeah. It is surprising. It, it's just so much of it, uh, putting the, uh, getting Randy in his jacket and stuffing him in yeah. it, falling down in the snow. But anybody who's ever grown up anywhere near snow can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly in the 40s. Nowadays, perhaps clothing is designed differently, so it doesn't have the yeah. same impact. But, right. <laughs> but if you grew up in the 40s, you looked like yeah. a tick about to pop, as the quote is. And well, there it's was, very funny. There was so much wealth of material in Shepherds, especially I, I delved a great deal of uh, material from his circuit. Uh, on He would do the comedy, college comedy mm -hmm. circus. Mm -hmm. I went four or five times, and he he did things spontaneously there that he didn't ever repeat, and I, I logged them, and there, that's, that's the little texture and detail. Then maybe a half a dozen things came to us, Phil Fragile and, and that was your his idea. side up. Yeah, those <laughs> things are the things that occurred to you, or uh, Randy, uh, he liked a piggy. I used, that was done to me, so I injected that. And, those little things we found, or Gene would run up, or Peter mm -hmm. would have some little yes. touch. The the uh, guys in their uh, gangster stripe with their hats was mm -hmm. you know not in the Black original Bart's story. Gang. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Much, they yeah. we we kind of but that's it. the fun stuff that comes up. But what was nice about it was you're not getting blue pages, pink pages, yellow pages mm -hmm. every morning Constantly in your trailer, everything. which you're kind of used to now of no, these I don't do things that. being rewritten consistently. So you really had a chance to talk about the script and you knew what was on the page was what you were going to shoot. I mean, yes, you come up with moments or you have right. an idea or, hey, mm -hmm. can I do this or say this? Of course. But uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was very well planned and yeah, it was, no. it was extremely, extremely right, refreshing. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is the film is episodic by nature. Mm -hmm. It has that one line running through it with him wanting the, the Red Rider BB gun. But on its surface, if you describe it to somebody, they say, well, that's episodic. That can't play well because mm -hmm. it's so episodic. And yet, mm -hmm. there's no sense of it being episodic when you're watching it. No. It's just a number of interesting events that occur. Mm -hmm. And all the time, of course, Ralphie is keeping his eye on that BB gun that he wants. Yeah, it's sequential. It's, just, it's, it's a few days before Christmas. Mm -hmm. It's those excitement and all the dynamics that occur. It before. doesn't seem overdone. It doesn't seem like you try to pack too much into it. So no. many films today either don't have enough or have too much. They don't seem to be able to strike a balance. But mm. you have that line running through and then, of course, all the different little sidelights with all the kids. Everybody mm -hmm. had something. Yeah. You know? yeah it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Was there... A favorite, I know, I know what you're, I'm asking you, I know, sorry, but what is your favorite scene in the movie? We'll, we'll get around. I, I think it's mine, too. I, I'm not sure, like Altman said, and what is your favorite movie? That's like asking which is your favorite child. Right. I'm not quite sure what I said to you the last time, what my favorite is. I think uh, 
the odd one, the oddball scene, this was a little invention of mine, sounds immodest, was the Chinese oh, yes. restaurant. That was end. your creation. That, yeah, that, that was not in Gene's Yeah, Gene writings. came in and saw that. He wasn't around. He got a little grumpy about that. The, the thing changed his mind. He saw it with an audience. <laughs> in, the book, in the book, it says we'll... We'll, we'll go out for dinner, but that's as that far as it goes. But, Chinese dinner. <laughs> you know, we needed a finale, so that in uh, the chopping off of the duck's head. And, but there are other scenes that are so wonderful when we, for me, anyway. When yeah. we talked before, you said that you probably most enjoyed the last scene where the father and mother are by themselves looking yeah. out the window. Mm -hmm. Because that just, to me, that encapsulates the entire meaning of the story. Yeah, the movie is so edgy. It's really as uh, somebody in L.A. wrote a review, so you think Christmas Story is this sweet little movie and said, well, Santa kicks a kid in the face, the kid lies to mom, mom lies to dad. The dad cusses. Yeah, yeah right. dad cusses story. all of them, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it is, and the, I think the well, reason is the truth. It's, it's is. truth. It was the yeah. real truth it's was true there. Feelings, yeah. And I think that's what, even in its his broadest sense, the old man is recognizable. There are people that are that expressive and that, and Ralphie and the old man are remarkably alike. They've both got this incredible will. Mm -hmm. Ralphie has a sly, quiet style, and the mm -hmm. old man is blustery, and, but nonetheless, he's got a will and he's got passion. So the leg lamp is silly. He loves it, and we yeah. love him for loving it. You know, and it's a we major love reward. Mom for it. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I think uh, I, I felt a tremendous amount of truth coming out of Shepard's work. With I think own. that's what makes him so outstanding as a writer. But they had been yeah. so hostile to each other essentially throughout the movie. Yet you knew they had affection. That's right. But yeah. and you saw it only in the end of the movie. That slight moment with Silent Night, mm -hmm. the most classic. Cornball Christmas songs, but it may be corny, but it's still great. No, it works beautifully. Yeah, and she puts, he puts his arm around her waist, and her she just slides her arm around his shoulder, and we're seeing the snow and this mm -hmm. thing, and we know the kids are safe upstairs, and yeah. Ralphie is cuddling his rifle. Wow! <laughs> now you hear all that described, you would say, oh, that's, that's right. but it's not because right. there's such heart and conviction, and I think. Uh, hard-edged truth through the movie, too, that it's not sentimental. It's a, sentimentality is unearned emotion. I think Ben Johnson said that, and mm -hmm. I think that fits here. This emotion is earned. And that was a hallmark of Shepard's writing, I think. He, yeah. he uh, always touched the reality. Yeah. It was outlandish in some cases, right. but he, right at the core was the real. Keen line. observations of mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. things like the tire blowing and the minute there's a bit, you know there's going to be a bit. Give me Four minutes or whatever it was. <laughs> There's a ritual to their mm -hmm. lives that continually plays. And mother's out. heard this before. She's yes. Said, well, here he goes again. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, right. We also did some scenes that didn't make it in. I which, know. Which was one of my the dream sequence. Is that the one? You yeah. Know? Certainly the most fun <laughs> scene to do as an actor was there was this big. It was we were in a studio in Canada and they had the main stage where the house was, and then they had built a complete other set on this other stage for it was a Flash Gordon sort of a sequence, right. and I was zapping off space aliens in like a little silver speedo <laughs> and a space hat and uh, was saving Flash who wasn't able to, I guess, um, conquer the uh, bad guys. And you know, it was a pretty fun, big, epic scene. Oh, yeah. And I guess you just realized as going through the process that it, yeah, it just it we did were, that up. It, it was one moment too many at the time, but when they did the reissue and they wanted in the DVD, we wanted desperately to use that scene. That would, wasn't there also a Santa Claus scene, or was Santa Claus part of the... Uh, no, I think there was an additional. There, there were two, I think, Santa that had scene, a lot of his fantasy was, scenes. Wasn't there one where the teacher comes to the visit the house? So right, to visit mom. Three. Those mm -hmm. three were the yeah. cuts. MGM the lost the negative. They lost the negative. They That's lost right. the negative. Yes, so we, we cut them, and uh, we thought we could save them that way, but uh, they lost the entire... Too bad. That's too bad things. because it would have been interesting. It wouldn't have been good to put it back in the movie, but having it as a deleted scene in segment the DVD, would have yes, been fun. Yeah, I think uh, the audience wouldn't have wanted, but they they worked. They were okay. But they, they were fun were. scenes for me because they were like the only scenes in the film when I actually talked because so much of it was Gene was you know sort of Gene right. Shepard's. That's head. right. 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 And kind yeah, of react. A pity to see those three scenes lost. The Santa Claus one was great fun too, um, but but the pacing so seems absolutely dead on, and maybe those scenes would have slowed it or would have distracted the audience They somewhat. did. They, yeah. uh, they were like uh, one reach too many, I think, one mm -hmm. level of fantasy You had the too Black much. Bart, and yeah. then uh, 
one more might have been. That pushes about as far as you can go. Yeah. And, and the it, life boy it, with the blindness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got Farkas and uh, those rituals and all the stories of life, uh, the Annie, uh, little orphan Annie, uh, mm -hmm. son of a bitch scene. <laughs> Very true to the time period. <laughs> that really, yep. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. the props were right out oh, of that era. He had a touch for the detail that was amazing, and we. It was not one. Was that Ruben Freed's uh, efforts, or was that the property department? Or it was um, a combination. combination of Ruben and uh, you know the production team. Uh, we were determined that we would not have anything that wasn't. Truly it made it a lot easier too, I think, for the actors because mm -hmm. when you're in that space and all those things around you that you're seeing right. are really true. And mm -hmm. you, know, you could, I mean, at a break, it wasn't as though they just had a Life magazine with the cover. They had the full Life magazine the that was life. there, so you could at breaks read it, and it, it sort of helped get you. Back in you know, everything time about into it. That the, uh, even the Chicago newspapers. You had mm -hmm. uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune, I think, where he's reading about the football. Mm -hmm. And, that, and a lot of movies Baseball. will not use the actual Tracks. name of the newspaper. They'll say the Chicago Sun or something like that, and they won't have it. But <laughs> everything was was out of that era. It's great Man. fun. Chicago Bears, Cubs. <laughs> no, that wasn't the line. Monsters no. of the Midway. More right. like bears. Right. right. More like uh, <laughs> puppies or something. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, Cubs. No, I can't remember. <laughs> That's funny. Chicago Cubs, Chicago Bear, Bear Cubs. Bear Cubs. Bear I'll Bear have to see the movie <laughs> tonight. How long has it been since you've seen it? Because you've actually sat down and watched On the, the big whole, screen. The whole movie. Last Christmas. I also oh, did watched you? it, you it watch um, <laughs> with my family back in New Hampshire. Uh, it's hard to get away from it. Now. Yeah, it is. I, I That's love good. We, we let it run. It's there in the, uh, in the den running uh, 24 hours a day. There were a number of scenes in the film which, again, to, uh, to most filmmakers would be a little risky, and that is using fast motion or, or special effects, uh, the iris in and iris out, which mm -hmm. were part of a different era of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you have those particular things written into the script so you know on that day you were going to eventually have an iris out or an iris in? Or was that I knew that was going to be the approach, whether I specifically editorially, as I say, I do pre-edit the movie before I shoot a movie. And I, it talks at college uh, with students, I've had quite a few, and they invariably ask if I'd like Peter mentioned the cards, I design a card for every shot. Editorially, mm -hmm. I want to know where the actors are moving, where the camera. This allows you to shoot with speed and with without rush, however. Mm -hmm. But students have asked, and it's a good question, don't you feel, sir, that you're limiting yourself by being so restrictive? Mm -hmm. And I say to them, no, as a point of fact, the opposite is true. Because I don't know if you've been on movie sets, but uh, you, if you were, you would have seen directors with their editor over in a corner going, that's because they had to change something or what they had done hadn't been thought out and hadn't worked. Constantly I'm getting inspirations from the actors or something appears on the set that I never saw before. Well, all I've got to do is change that, work that wonderful piece of business in, get to my cards and get back to my editorial so I have a rhythm and a flow. I'm not dictating where I'm going to cut. I have footage, obviously, to sure. cut. So from that sense, I had a pretty good idea that I would iris out as the bullies chased Ralphie mm -hmm. and uh, the and gang. The, the speeded up motion was also a part yes, of your thing, was, even before yeah, you rolled the camera. That's correct, yeah. But it also it, gives you a good sense, I think, of the time period. Because we shot the techniques, mm -hmm. obviously, that were done a long were, time ago. They were right. of the period. So convincingly, so it, recently a stewardess came up to me on a plane when I was traveling, and she said, geez, you look a lot like this guy who's in this Christmas story. You know, you don't want to be like, well, as a matter of fact, I am. So you're kind of like, yeah, all right, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, but it couldn't be you because that, that film was made in the 40s. <laughs> made in the 40s. So it, you know, great. I think it's very, it's very convincing of the time period. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, we actually shot the high, the speed in camera. We didn't do it as a special CGI as it would now be called. That's no right. Yeah, it was all we planned. Just, we just undercranked. And, and it, uh, it fits, and it's not enough. It's not too much. It's no. just enough to set the tone. Yeah. And to get a laugh. Yeah. When you really get one chance at it, you better get it right. <laughs> yeah, right. When you're, it doesn't you're, turn out, right. you can't go back you're, and you're using your day's film up. So and that's, just that's having right. Randy running along behind like a little puppy <laughs> yeah. trying to chase the rest of the dogs. With, it's very charming. Yeah, with Paul Zaza's delightful music, which I yeah. think is a vital part of the movie as well. Again, a good, a good selection. And rather than having a, a completely original score, some of it's original music, but yes. most of it's source music. Yes. And it works great. Mm -hmm. It's not too much to... The, the cast, Peter, the, the boys, the, the other guys, Randy and, and Flick and so on, they were all great to work with. I understand that uh, you had a good time in the we hotels. Fun. Well, you're that age. Or 
11, yeah, 12, 13. Stories. But yeah, I mean, you're still a boy at that age. I mean, you're a professional working, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day and on the weekends when your days are off, I mean, you want to, you know, you're in a nice hotel and you're knocking on doors and running away and doing all the stuff you do as kids. And then, you know, when we'd go to a set like with the sled in Higby's, over there to visit Santa. I mean, it must have been a nightmare for him because he couldn't get us off the thing. Really? <laughs> just climbing up and going down and during lunch and not eating and just playing. I mean, Cleveland it's, it's, is a surprisingly fun town, actually. It's we had a great region. time. Yeah. And we went to Canton to the, uh, hall, to the hall of Fame and, you know. Really? We, uh, mm -hmm. tw we, we toured around, we had some time off and Bob was encouraging of us spending time together because it only helps translate, you know, that onto the screen that, that you're friends and they were all great guys and you can't help but sort of bond because you're, you're on location, you're working hard. Sure. And, you're going through your schoolwork together and all that stuff. But downtown Cleveland was a terrific place mm -hmm. for that, for the opening scenes and all later on. And they kept it dressed. And they kept it dressed for you. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing that they had torn down two major buildings which opened up the whole of downtown Cleveland. It wasn't like that until about the year, a little bit the year before. Very lucky. You wouldn't have seen that scope. You would have had two buildings sitting in mm -hmm. that square. And they later, I think, put new buildings in. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, it was perfect. We could see the whole of this, you know, good-sized town. Uh, well, it's interesting because that part of, of the Christmas story is flattering to Gene Shepard's hometown. Hammond is not did not town. look at all like that. No. <laughs> in fact, it was very dull. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, did you go to Hammond at all? Ribbon free? Can't and say I've been there. No. No, yeah, you didn't did. miss anything. No. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. But downtown Hammond is really not interesting at all. No. Whereas where you shot with Higby's, the town square and you have this whole sense of a downtown area. Right. And Reuben told me when he went to Hammond with you, Hammond, Indiana, mm -hmm. to scout to see about the types of homes that he could replicate somewhere mm -hmm. else. He said it was, it was difficult to, yeah, to it find Yeah, it's a suburban town and essentially okay. it didn't have, and Gene agreed right away, he said, we'll pretend it's Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although Hammond is quite a distance from It's Chicago. about a half hour away. Oh, right, that's right. Half it hour is close. It's, yeah. it's on the state line. Yeah. And uh, when I was growing up in that area, it was easy to get to Chicago, either by the South Shore, which was the electric, like right. New Haven, mm -hmm. or just driving in. Right. This is before interstates, so it was uh, right. about a half hour. Well, we put the boys on a streetcar, remember, mm -hmm. by their house. They got yeah. a streetcar, so they could have gone. Yeah. That's right. That's what we did. It was very did. much... Yeah, mm -hmm. we tried for that idea that the town yeah. was Justifying a streetcar it. distance away, mm -hmm. which can be 20 minutes. Or, that's right. So I think that's, that's right. what we were implying. And I didn't realize until the end credits that you had shot in Cleveland because my impression on first seeing it back mm -hmm. in the 80s was that it was shot somewhere in the Midwest Yeah. and maybe near Hammond. Yeah. But uh, I knew the downtown area was not Hammond. Mm -hmm. There was no Higby's anywhere near right. us. So but I where, where they lived could have easily been Hammond. That's right. Where the house and the, the school house, and all yeah, that, it's, it's but perfect. they get on the streetcar to take them mm -hmm. downtown to Chicago. That was yeah. our idea. That was, Gene came up with that. And, uh, In fact, the house we used was pretty much a shell. It yeah. was used for the exteriors and then a lot of the split scenes like the leg lamp in the window, mm -hmm. me shooting the bad guys out the window, uh, shooting my eye out and then going inside were at two completely different times. Yeah. And probably goes back to what you were saying about being prepped. You really got to know it because we're shooting in Cleveland and two months later, you're in a studio matching identically right. to what you did, and so much so that like there's an over-the-shoulder mm -hmm. shot of the bad guys, and then there's this shot of me, you know, in the uh, studio. So you're trying to keep it all straight. Right. There's a wonderful scene near the end when Randy, when uh, Ralphie, <laughs> Ralphie, <laughs> where would that come from? Where Ralphie? Excuse me. <laughs> where Ralphie's looking out the window, mm -hmm. and it has just snowed, or it has it has mm -hmm. sleeted and right. frozen. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you shot that. That was a beautifully shot scene, very touching at the same time. That's fascinating in the overview of it. We literally did that all night with a light spray to create mm -hmm. the real thing, not mm -hmm. a fake thing. Mm -hmm. It turned out gorgeously, but we had a terrible problem. I'll come back to that. Coincidentally, and it, it was a very dry season in Cleveland that year. Most of the snow you see in Christmas Story is our snow, mm -hmm. not, not God's snow. And we didn't have classical snow blowers. We had from a ski company a hundred miles away putting that snow down and they were doing it all night. So we went to the neighborhood and had to ask everyone to put up with these incredibly loud things blowing snow. So all the street that Ralphie lives on where you see snow right. down the street and around the corner was put out that night by 
ski slope snowblowers, which are incredibly loud, and these people never complained one time. They were but, pretty happy. I, yeah, I think they liked it. There. it was they, neat. they were it's excited. It's not like you're living in here, you know, where you're you know, Beverly Hills, used they to it. Right. That, yeah. Yeah. It was a fun thing, and they would watch out of their windows, they and were, they got snow. They were part kids. of it, too. We got to invite them to be uh, street extras, whoever wanted to be. But that scene outside, we um, have a good eye. We spent a long time getting that to look as magical as it's Christmas morning. It's the magic. Mm -hmm. And what Ralphie looks out of, he needs to see magic. And he does. And if you're growing up in that area, you do see that during the winter between November and January. Oh. You look out the window and there, there's frost all over the window, little designs, mm -hmm. and the trees are sparkling. Mm -hmm. It is magical. Yes. And that's yeah. another example of the split scenes where yeah, you've exactly. got over my shoulder looking and then sort of two months later. That was a this way, reaction to it looking inside right. the Over his stage. shoulder is in Cleveland, mm -hmm. where they're outside the real thing and looking mm -hmm. back in him is mm -hmm. in the stage. Wow, it's months later and you're trying to think. It's oh, miraculous. Yeah. Yeah. There. The, uh, the majority of the interiors were in Toronto, however. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And only the one or two exteriors. The school was in Toronto. Yeah, what was in Cleveland was the exterior of Ralphie's house and the street and um, the downtown, of course, and I think we had the one school in Cleveland and one, or were they both in St. Catharines? I don't remember. I don't remember. The, the main school was in St. Catharines in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's the only place we got some snow. We got snow, mm -hmm. a little bit of snow before we Try went it. to do the tongue scene. And the schoolyard, the schoolhouse was inside the school. But So Cleveland was basically downtown and Ralphie Street. Um, I believe maybe a couple of other small Good parts choices. I can't remember right now. You've just provided me with a segue to your explanation of the tongue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Flick's problem with that pole. Right. And I, no CGI. It was not a CGI tongue. It was uh, actually uh, Scott Schwartz's tongue. <laughs> so explain how you did this. This is a magical piece of work right here. We, uh, they built a, they drilled a hole in the tongue right where his tongue was to go and they put a suction pipe up and fitted it, form fitted it right to the hole and then just covered over with light uh, cloth. So as he got closer and closer to the tongue and in one, remember the first take, mm -hmm. it literally got him from out here. He, was, <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't breathe. We had to stop and run and pull him off. So his guy's a little less tongue pressure this time. But so it worked the take as he's real nervous going yeah, up. Yeah, he had already had it. He was, so he, he was, got he up there and it went perfect. And he, yes. he could actually pull use back, his weight and back. try to pull back and actually, uh, pretty, otherwise it wouldn't. It was pretty smart. If he had to fake it, um, it wouldn't have worked. Now, yeah. that's what was so surprising. When you yeah. see that on the screen, you yeah. think, well, that kid really must have practiced. <laughs> yeah. But how'd he get his tongue to stretch out that way? Right. <laughs> it's remarkable. Yep. Now, you pointed out earlier that there, there are no trick effects in this. There, there are mechanical effects yes. and on-set effects. But that's, that's a tribute to your creativity and uh, your crew and because budget. <laughs> the budget uh -huh. was restricting you, yes. which mm -hmm. very often makes a, a film better. You. Yeah, I don't think we did any visual effects other than the standard opticals of the, you know, the, Just the, the irises. Within the Flash, even the Flash Gordon sequence, right? There yes, was really even nothing. then, no, nothing. We did it uh, all on, on the set. And the other challenge that we did was, as I said, I didn't have a lot of dialogue as right. much in the movie. So much of it was the narration, and Bob would want to hold a one-shot, so mm -hmm. it would be read and then you'd have to react to it sort of in time, knowing that if you wanted to just stay there and not cut, it had to be, and Bob actually read a lot of it. Mm. Really? Bob wound up reading a lot of it, and then Gene, I guess, had to match your timing. <laughs> later. Yeah, I'd become a very good uh, duplicator of Shepard, and the narration, that's the one thing that did change during the shooting, often with what presented itself, and uh, became a very even Gene complimenting on Copying his narration That's technique. Style. That is a yeah. I was so, yes, it is. But it was helpful having enough. one voice and having the director also reading that. So you've sort of got one guy that mm -hmm. you're working with and mm -hmm. he's leading you through the whole thing. Right. Did Gene know going in that he was going to have a cameo near the end in the department store? Was that something you sprung on? I don't think so. I think we decided, I think I had it in my mind we would do it, but uh, that was early in the shooting and I figured I'd get it over with quickly. How few so, people catch that and it's his voice? Yeah, too. and they didn't affect the voice, and it changed it. Right. His voice goes from the narration right. to his dialogue, and then the next line I think is me saying something of "I gotta go," and nobody catches it. No, yeah. no they don't. So funny, and even people that know him well, they, yeah. they're not used to seeing him in mm -hmm. a hat and a suit and a tie. No, I think that's. 
probably at the, the, his uh, fedora or whatever he was yeah, wearing exactly. was not his trademark. He, he usually was on camera, if he was anywhere on camera, was without, without a hat. Yes, so right. Wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen him that way. So d disguised him. Well, the, the line stretched all the way back to Terre Haute. Yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. <laughs> it, was, it was nice to, to hear all those names from, from when I was growing up in the area. Right. Because they were absolutely correct. Right. The old man talks about some guy in Griffiths, Indiana. Right. That's, that was literally about 10 miles away from where Gene mm -hmm. grew up. So all these little references make it that much more authentic. Rather than fabricating a name. Right. Podunk totally. Village or anything like that. It just has an authenticity to it that right. makes it play. And it is interesting since it was Cleveland and uh, not Hammond and Chicago. Uh, that, uh, but no one's ever had any trouble with that at all. I mean, the the country is sophisticated enough about movies to know oh, there sure. must have been a reason that yeah. we needed to do that. Yeah. So, and if anybody grew up in the Hammond area, they'd know there was a reason. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> completely unphotogenic. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you were very lucky to have Cleveland look so good. Yeah. yeah. No, the people who grew up in Cleveland are quite proud of the way it looks. Oh, so I'm yeah. sure. Higbees and, and for years, Cleveland had a, a very bad reputation yes. because it was on Lake Erie with all the oil spills, and, and mm -hmm. Randy Newman has made quite a case for, for that. That's, that's changed quite a bit of that. Oh, yeah. Change it, was, it was a great city. They welcomed us with open arms. Yeah, I think and they were since great the hosts. early 80s, really it, its reputation did a complete reversal. I think so. It's a charming city. It, mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, it, had, it had a great deal of the old industrial world still there. That was important mm -hmm. for us to go out into the, when you guys are driving on your bike to the, uh, um, where am I getting the second? No, no. When you, we see the dock and the ships and all that. Part of Cleveland, we got to see mm -hmm. uh, right. Chicago was very much the same. Yeah. We got to see industrial the old city. industrial right. world. Steel mill around there. We're looking out past your house yeah. down into the industrial valley to mm -hmm. start the movie, mm -hmm. going past the uh, hillbillies and uh, finding Focuses. you guys. Right. Yep. Was <laughs> Cleveland, your, Reuben, and your first choice, or was there? A, I think another we saw. City that you I can't saw. remember. I think we saw a couple of other um, places. Um, but I think I think Detroit. We went to Detroit, and uh, but uh, the, U, the Union situation was good in Cleveland, also. Uh -huh. So that had a. I think there were a couple of places we saw, but Cleveland was very, pretty quickly picked as the it's, one. It hasn't been used much in films. Detroit's been used an awful lot in yeah. as background. No, I don't think it has been too much. The no. Union stuff was helpful because there was a lot of kids that needed to work a lot of hours. Yeah, and, and right. we were <laughs> able oh, to. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the, the classroom. <laughs> That was in Toronto, though. The kids in the classroom. That was in Toronto, Toronto but yes. But other kids uh, in the Cleveland area. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Go downtown and... Absolutely. Um, Shooting nights, we were on split days. Yep. That's mm -hmm. right. Shooting nights, sort of 6 p.m. And that's, to 6 a.m. that probably prolonged your shoot a couple of weeks, didn't it, because of the, the child laws regarding oh, yeah, shooting? Oh, yeah. A couple of weeks here and there, but it didn't make that much difference. We still, shoot. yeah, had to uh, adhere to the laws, which kept our days from being... Uh, and the kids were so much a part of the movie. There were a few scenes without uh, Peter and him, but not many. Most no, of them. Yeah. There were very few scenes with scene. just mom and dad. Because and it's really his story. Yeah, and there's nobody that, else. The rifle. Yeah. Yeah, right. He's with everybody, Santa, the you know, school, the teacher. It goes on and on. Peter has gone on the record as saying that he never minds talking about this, which is not typical of actors talking about films which have become so famous. Mm -hmm. What is there about the film that that uh, you love so much that you never mind discussing it with anybody who asks you. There must be many things, but is there any one thing that stands out? No, it's, I think, based on the reaction it creates within people is so genuine. Mm -hmm. And it just has, certainly more so than anything I've ever been involved with, has a real profound effect on people. And it's become a tradition in their households, and it's something that they look forward to, something that they can relate to. And the sincerity that I'm approached with, it's just, I mean, you, 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 you can't not, you know, grant it, grant it to them. Uh, yeah. A couple of things I've done, you know, that I'd like to forget, you know, as all <laughs> actors have, I'm sure you've had, mm -hmm. you know, kind of your speed bumps. What? But it's a film that's gone on and really managed to catch lightning in a bottle in a, in a, in a pretty neat way and seems to only be growing more and more. So it's, it's, it happens a lot, and it's also kind of a seasonal thing, too, you know. There's mm -hmm. a couple-month window where you know people are going to be spotting you. That's right. I've, that's um... Right. But um, the fact that um, it comes up every season is, and people are so enthused about it does make it, as Peter say, almost impossible to resist. Oddly enough, I've done and do the 
release of the new DVD, I've done a great deal of uh, TV and radio newspaper spots. Mm -hmm. And invariably, on virtually every case, maybe 19 or 20 very sophisticated reviewers like yourself or TV announcers, uh, TV show host, we spend the first five or ten minutes talking about their experience <laughs> with the movie and what mm -hmm. their family does and how this cousin comes in on the New Year's Eve and on New Year's Day they watch it on TNT on the uh, 24 hours so right. we get that out of the way and that happened every single time. You're talking about very jaded, sophisticated people when you're talking That's about right. news people essentially. And that, 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 so that when you realize it means that much to these people, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's there's, there's sort of no feeling at all. I mean, it's extremely natural to just talk to him about it. I was in New Hampshire with uh, my ex-wife and my kids a few years back, and we were at a restaurant where we were going for New Year's Eve, a um, little repast, and uh, we heard something that sounded like dialogue, and we stopped and listened, and we were in booths. And we listened over there, and it, we, it was Christmas story. It was the dialogue being done. I looked over the table and saw this family of four, mother, father, child, a 12-year-old, and about an 8-year-old. And we called the manager over and said, those people are, oh, that's the, whichever their name was, they, that's their tradition. They come here for New Year's Eve dinner, and they sat and did the whole movie, exactly. played every part, parts that weren't hmm. uh, for father would play, uh, you know, the Swede and Mom would play the. It's uh, pretty ambitious. Unbelievable, it's and they knew it yeah, down to. Well. And they would never not only say the dialogue, but they would describe. You know, Peter uh, flipping the uh, the cover off the car and going, "Oh fudge!" <laughs> you know, they had all those details, and they say then the thing would roll. I, I was flabbergasted. That's amazing. Yeah, that it, that it was shows amazing. the impact right well, there. Right? And those people were probably not rare. There must be people who quote whole lines of dialogue. Oh yeah, that's without common, doing the entire movie. But, but the entire movie on start, everybody to finish. Yeah. Peter, you still have the rabbit, uh, the bunny uh, costume. I do. Uh, you, do you, uh, yeah, they gave me the bunny costume. I haven't been in it since. I haven't been in it since. Uh, it might be a little snug. I think so. I hope so. And warm. Um, <laughs> Times get tough. It's been, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. It's I think in the attic somewhere. <laughs> Stuffed great. away, and, I got a, and they uh, gave me a gun as well, which was nice. That's right, the, the daisy rifle folks. Right? Yeah, with yeah. the compass and the stock and all that. And <laughs> that, I know, uh, Gene swears, swore that there was something like that when he was growing up with the compass and the stock and the, and the sundial, but the daisy people Say there wasn't said there wasn't. It was really another gun, it was a different style, mm -hmm. the Buck Jones version, I oh, guess. Oh, I see. And Buck Jones is a real actor. Right. But I understand Gene was so adamant that he remembered it that they said, oh, well, <laughs> let's, just, well, think let's pretend it, there was one. They made it a lot funnier, too, because it's not just this. It's, he's sort of going on about the details. That's right. The right. It's compass the stock on the sun with all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. It just makes it funnier that he knows every little By thing road. Yeah. That's That's right. Right. yeah. It's just delightful. The power of radio. How long does it, did it take you to shoot that uh, the bunny costume? Was it a whole day on the set with that? It took him about three days to convince me days. to get into it. <laughs> really? And then once he did that, you know, we were able to start. I shut down the set. I refused. Um, <laughs> when we started, I don't know. It was. I wanted to get through it. I mean, there wasn't a lot of acting required in that scene. You know, you're still a 12 year old boy. You want to be. And God forbid if someone caught you in it. You know, <laughs> wearing the bunny suit. So, came down the stairs. Uh, got out, and we, you know. Fortunately, Bob shot it in a shot. Just I think just a little tilt up. Tilting up from it. the yeah. feet. Yeah. So he, he covered it both in one. What was it? So we it improvised. Was, it was quick. You look like a deranged Easter Bunny. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Was that an improvised line yeah. from Darren? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's one of the great lines. It's one of the most memorable lines mm -hmm. in the film, isn't it? I had never worked with someone like Darren who knew so much about every aspect of a process. I mean, I, I would hear. A uh, department, you know, talking about uh, how can we balance this. The grip department, he'd sort of casually yell out, "Take a shim, who over there?" They'd look and they'd know it. I mean, he'd been around. He's just such a veteran and such a pro that he'd been around so much. He just knew absolutely everything and had such an ease and a shorthand in the way he spoke about things about him. It was it was really a great learning experience for me. And nothing was ever a problem. And it was always he was. In, I mean, he was just such a such mm -hmm. a real, real pro. Yeah, he got off the plane when I met him, and there had been several other actors before him considered strongly for the role, but uh, 
He got off the plane and he said, all right, now who was the one that had the good sense to put me in this role? <laughs> and I could honestly say it was me. I was pushing for him, really. A couple of the other actors were pretty powerhouse people, so sure, it was a, sure. but that didn't work. And all the time I was saying to him, Jim, you know, Darren, Darren, and they didn't care anyway. So <laughs> he was the man, and I did five other films with Darren subsequently. Well, he was the perfect choice for that. Mm -hmm. And he and Melinda Dillon perform as if they were married. They, they do. They, they fit they together. They really do. <laughs> as if they had always been together. Yep. It's quite uh, remarkable. Uh, yes, it, it, it really is. They, they caught something there that was, the, the affection, is, it's there, but it's so caught up in their different worlds. The mm -hmm. classic mother runs the, the house and the old man runs the outside world. And, did she read with him before you decided to have her play the role, or was that already determined separately? No, that was determined. They were stars enough that they did not read. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, Darren was not at the last minute, but fairly near the end of the process when I finally won out and got Darren the role. Mm -hmm. The leg lamp scene certainly is uh, is one of the most famous scenes in the film, and it's one of Shepard's. It's out of she one of Shepard's stories, isn't yes. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did Ruben, the, uh, the production designer, design that, or was that something that was brought in? Do you remember where that came from? I think we designed it, yes. Yeah. I think um, we had, there was, I think Gene had gotten us a picture of something, but it wasn't quite the thing we needed, so I think we, we wanted it a little bit more salacious than, <laughs> uh, than the rather tame leg that uh, we saw. So uh, that, it, that it was. Yes. <laughs> yes, you remember. That's right. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the production designer designed that. Uh, I remember the reactions on the set when we saw it. No one had ever seen anything like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you felt, didn't bring it out until you're ready to shoot the scene. That's correct. That, that's yeah, that, that so day. it would surprise Peter and, that's right. and Egan that's correct. and everybody. Yep. Had Darren seen it? No. no. Nobody had seen it. I don't think so. So when no. he was reacting, it was... Well, the way he puts it down and is sort of fumbling <laughs> with a hand yeah. doesn't know what to do <laughs> with it. Like, right. And trying to figure out what the heck it was. Yeah. Uh, finally, it's a leg lamp. So, <laughs> just so, so, so silly. And then that leads into Bob's cameo in the film. That's right. You are <laughs> Swede. The Swede on the with street. A, with a southern with accent. With a southern accent. <laughs> a few the people most have caught that. Swede. I know. <laughs> well, only a few people have caught that. That I, I started doing the Swedish accent, which was okay. I said, you know what? It let's, shifted. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's let's let's. He's called the Swede, but what the heck? And then I did it in a southern accent. <laughs> no one's ever. And Darren calls yeah. me Swede about four times. That's you know, right. you've had cameos in five movies, did you say? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I'm Alfred Hitchcock, but there, there are bits well, and pieces here and you're there. You're getting there. A few more. You can yep. See yeah. Yep. Yep. Will. When you walk up, and it's a scene where the old man is looking back at the window, which has been decorated now with the leg lamp. Correct. And of course, Mom is anxious for him to come inside so she can turn it off. Right. Mm -hmm. But Swede walks up. Right. Says, what, what you got there? What, what is that? Yeah, what is that? It's well, a major award. It's a major award. <laughs> you, you dummy. You fool. What's the, <laughs> what? Oh, what is it? It's a major, that's a major award. Look at there in the window. It's an award. He won that. <laughs> Doggone. A major award. Now, had you thought about <laughs> being in that scene before you rolled cameras? or? Um, <laughs> So much probably that day. That I, day, you I just probably thought, well, decided. Uh, there hadn't been anybody assigned to that part yet. No, just, no, I probably, I think I invented the part. I don't think it was there. I think I realized, it was, it was a spur of the moment thing. I realized he needed to play off somebody right. to make his comments. And you would be the perfect choice. Of yes, course. Of course. So why not? And, why not? And, and there was nobody else. He has excellent Nobody taste. else could have possibly played that no. role. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Bob had been talking about that role for two months before yeah, that I scene. He was prepping. Mm -hmm. When the nomination lines, didn't come down, right. I was, <laughs> was, I was bitter. <laughs> he you. actually blamed it on Darren for not giving him enough. Right. <laughs> One more take would have probably made a difference. Exactly, yeah. right. That's, uh, that's the excuse you could have used. The take where I took my pants down and said, God, I think they copied my leg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sue the son of the guns. <laughs> Very funny. Good. Any last comments about the, uh, the durability of of the film and, and perhaps uh, what you hope audiences take away from it when they see it. Perhaps many of them have never seen it on the big screen. This is what's remarkable. They've never seen it. 
That's why I'm plying Warner Brothers so fiercely to let's, put let's it in the it theaters back. next year. They're going to Very much. clean up. Isn't that wonderful? People will be dying. Open it the week before Thanksgiving, like we did. And, and don't do, pull it before Christmas. And <laughs> Yes, and please, <laughs> let's have it during Christmas. And by all means, keep the 24 hours TNT. Don't. That won't make a bit of difference. They'll still yeah. do tremendously. It's because people want to see it. The, the 38.4 million people, as I said, who watched the TNT, mm -hmm. some version of it last year, that's a sixth of the nation. And very few of those people have ever seen the movie on a screen where it belongs. And that's different from a release of Star Wars or right. Indiana Jones, where you know billions of people have seen it on the screen. And it's maybe the only time it's ever happened, yeah. because it, it, we had the good fortune of having our theater run just when the video phenomenons began to happen, mm -hmm. and we became a video world. It took about it two years for it to really start to catch on. Catch on and become what we call a cult film. And ten years film. later, MGM, we did a sequel, and as they said to me, we're not doing a sequel, Bob, because we didn't make a lot of money That's on right. the first one. We're doing a sequel <laughs> because we did, and uh, it's only it's continued to grow. Peter, what is it about A Christmas Story that has uh, made it endure for now 20 years and likely to endure for many more than that? It's it's hard to say, uh, and it's it's sometimes hard to even try to articulate on top of the film because, for whatever reason, it works. But I think that, and we touched on it earlier, it in so many ways encapsulates the 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 American family. It's not a film that you can not only appreciate and say, "Oh, I was entertained. I really enjoyed it." There's an aspect in that movie that seemingly everybody can connect with, and say, "That was my sort of childhood. That was my family. That was my dream as well." And uh, and I think ultimately it's like what we said, the family is played in a very real way. It's not, it's not a sitcom family. It's a very real family with a real heart. And uh, I don't know, you know, I've been fortunate to have done a lot of stuff and uh, we really seem to catch magic with this. And um, I'm certainly at the end of the day thrilled to have uh, been a part of it. Well, there are very few films that can legitimately be called classics, but this is one of them. And that is a great way to end. Thank you, Bob Clark, Thank Peter you, Billingsley. And thank you, folks, for joining us again for In the Credits. We'll see you again.